light did not scatter and the losses were reasonably low. That was kind of the turning point. And once that was possible, we were able to make you know, much more advanced photonic circuits right into the silicon. So now that we can do that, we're starting to ask the questions of how can we use optical interconnects together with you know, the, uh, the high performance compute nodes and memory systems to really get some advantages in terms of both bandwidth and energy efficiency. As, as you noticed already, you know, I think power, power, energy efficiency is gonna be a very important theme, especially on the hardware side. Okay, so now I'm gonna shift back a little bit and actually talk about some of the trends in high performance computing and, and where the photonics comes in. So what we did here was we just plotted the top 10 uh, supercomputers, you know, the average of the top 10 systems, right, from the, from the top 500. Just, just from 2010, so the last seven years, right? And so what you see here is that um, the, uh, you know, the, you know the, the top performing system has been going up. If you look at the top 500, you know, we're, we're up to you know, over 100 petaflop, I think, these days, right? So the top you know, flops uh, is, is continuing to go up. Um, but what you see here is really the breakdown of where the contribution to that performance is coming from. And what this is showing is that the vast majority of the contribution to the performance gains is just coming from the, you know, from the processors, right? Um, so we have, um, you know, if you look at that, this is, a, is this a laser? You figure that, you know, the optics person should figure out how to use the laser, but ah, okay, there we go. Okay, okay I passed the test. So, um, uh, so you, you see the, uh, you know, this 19x over the last seven years is really from the, the computation capability of the individual, of the individual node. Um, and maybe a little bit more, but, but, you know, everything else is, you know, just maybe, we're just increasing the number of nodes, right? So we've gone from about 28,000 to 35,000 nodes. So this is just to keep in mind. So we're just increasing, increasing, increasing the flops, and that's how we get to the top of the 500. Great. At the same time, while we're doing all of that, the, uh, the bandwidth, the communication, the interconnect is really lagging behind, okay? And so even though the top line, the flops, is continuing to go up and we get the headlines, the actual performance of the system is suspect because if I have the flops, maybe I also have the memory, but I don't have a way to really connect them. It's not scaling proportionally. That's, that's a major problem, right, in terms of my, my ultimate uh, execution performance. So again, this is the same, you know, top 10 over the last seven years. And here you have the 19x that we've gotten. Um, but the node bandwidth, you know, is, is, you know, there was a little bump here, and then it's kind of really flat. So the node bandwidth has been 3.3x over those same seven years. So really not keeping up at all with those top 500. And what you see here, that red line, is the byte per flop ratio. So we're kind of losing ground. In other words, that gap is continuing to open up, and we're really losing ground in the, in, in the sort of the rule of thumb ratio of the bytes per flop of, of, the, of the compute system. So what can we do? I mean, right now, we're actually, uh, we actually lost ground. So we're um, at about 0.06 um, bytes per flop. And you know, we're just trying to kind of get it back up to um, it, it, the, la the last one, uh, the, the Sunway is 0 0.004 bytes per flop. So that, that's pretty, pretty scary. So, so let, let's look at kind of what's needed. Um, uh, we need to, so, so one is we definitely need the bandwidth. Obviously we need to, connect, we need to close that, that bytes per flop uh, gap. Now the other important aspect is the, is the power dissipation, right? So we want the bandwidth. And we also, you can, you can actually get more bandwidth for, uh, if you're willing to expend more power. That, that is not, you know, that's not a problem. But as we know, there we, we have a hard limit or some limitation on the total amount of power that we can have in the systems. So if we are considering the, you know, sort of an exaflop or an exascale system, um, the, the power number that's typically used, even though it's a little bit constraining is let's say about 20 megawatts for the total power system. It's not really gonna be 20 megawatts, maybe it'll be 50 megawatts or something like that. But let me just kind of give you um, 
uh, you know, a sense of why the, besides the fact that, you know, we're limited in the total amount of power, uh, one rule of thumb to keep in mind is that, you know, for every, uh, every megawatt of power, right, is about a million dollars just to turn, just to turn the lights on, on that megawatt of power, right? You haven't hired any computer scientist, you haven't purchased a machine, you haven't done anything. All you're trying to do is turn the power to turn the power of the machine on. For every megawatt, it's a million dollars a year. So that 20 megawatts is a $20 million a year power bill before you did anything, approximately. Um, so that's why this is kind of a, an important limit to have, right? On top of that, we're also, the, the cost of the machine is maybe about $200 million, right? Okay, so these are sort of reasonable numbers. And then we can assume that about 15% of the, let's say the dollar budget is going to the interconnect. Uh, about 15% of the power budget, the total power budget is going to the interconnect. These are just kind of, you know, usual things. And then we can get, you know, kind of some limitations on, you know, what are, you know, what, what, what's the envelopes of what we can actually do? Um, and what can photonics do to, act, to, to enhance those, those efficiencies? Um, so a little bit more you know, under the engine to kind of see wh what the interconnect today and where photonics might fit in. So this is, this is a kind of a high level uh, uh, diagram of a typical interconnect architecture. We're gonna have a whole interconnect talk, I believe just following mine. And so you'll get much more of that. Um, but what I, what I am talking about here is that in today's systems, uh, typically, there, there is optics, there is fibers that you will see in these, these high performance systems, and they're typically used to connect up the long distance between the racks. Those are, those are the places where they're typically used. Um, and there are a few reasons for that. I mean, one is that over the optical cable, yes, you know, they're, they're much thinner, they're less bulky, and you can, get, you can get very high bandwidth, and it can go over a long distance. That's one of the important advantages of optical communications or optical interconnects is that you know, over, over an optical fiber, we can send the signal, very, very high speed signals over very long distances. We all are familiar with fiber optic you know, uh, communications and, and, and telephone, uh, you know, or I guess these days, um, that Sprint commercial is so old that it really dates myself, so I will not, I will not go there. <laughs> um, so, so this is where it's used. Uh, but this is not really what I'm talking about in terms of silicon photonics. So what, sil what silicon photonics will do is it will, it, it's not just going to be this sort of add-on package that we add, you know, and, and put fibers to connect the racks together. The silicon photonics is going to go into the, you know, as close as possible to the actual integrated node. And how close do we get? You know, how, how much co-integration, co-packaging can we get um, is, is, is part of the key question. Because if we can get the optical signal to start almost all the way at the chip, that means that we can get the most energy efficiency and the highest bandwidth to go across the system. So we don't have to go through, what I mean is we don't have to go through all these conversions before we actually get to the optical domain. Okay, and so, um, it, you know, so we're talking about, you know, in this, in this picture, it's not very aggressive, but we're talking about adding, you know, these orange boxes, which are, you know, many more optical uh, sort of interfaces, many more optical interconnects, much closer uh, to the node. Um, and now, uh, let, let's look a little bit inside the node. So this is, again, this is kind of a typical, uh, you know, my picture of a high performance compute node. These days, it's pretty heterogeneous. You know, it has, it probably has some kind of a, um, you know, a, an interconnect network that we just heard about, um, you know, some, some variations of, of processors, there may be some GPUs, some CPUs, some accelerators, you know, all, all kinds of stuff, all different, perhaps different kinds of memory and external memory. And, and then we can actually, you know, place some, uh, some numbers on, you know, if we want to start replacing some of these interconnects. Not, not, it's, you know, not inside the actual chip, not the actual you know, core to core interconnect, but for example, connecting between you know, these different types of uh, components within the node, we can do that in the optical domain. Uh, let me also just add, um, uh, since I won't be able to go into too much detail about the photonics at, at this level talk, 
that you know, the other advantages of, of the optical connections is besides the high speed and potentially the low energy or the energy efficiency is that we have another domain of connectivity which is the wavelength domain, right? In, in one optical, let me just take one step back. So in one optical waveguide or one optical fiber, unlike an electronic wire, I can actually send multiple colors, multiple channels of a signal. We all know that if I have, you know, if I have wires on a chip or, 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 or I lay down the interconnect, I have to make sure that there's enough separation between those wires so there's no interference. And, you know, if I send, and if I send very high speed signals, that, that makes it even more challenging. You know, to lay down 10, giga, 10 gigahertz signals and, and so forth is very challenging. In the optics, it's very easy. I can modulate, I can, I can send a 40 gigahertz signal in an optical fiber and an optical waveguide on one wavelength, and then on a, another wavelength that's very close to it, I can send yet another 40 gigahertz signal and another 40 gigahertz signal and so on and so on. And I can send in one, in one optical uh, sort of wire, I can send close to a terabit of bandwidth. Okay, that's the main difference. And then I can line up those terabit, terabit, terabit uh, uh, wires and, and that's really where the bandwidth density comes from. So that's the wavelength domain. The other aspect of the wavelength domain is that these, these different wavelengths, you know, they don't interfere with each other. They're independent channels for the most part. They don't interfere with each other. So I don't really have crosstalk. And so I can also separate them. And so for example, I can think of these interesting connectivity architectures where you know, I, ded I can dedicate different wavelengths to these different components. Maybe some wavelengths are going to the DRAM, some wavelengths are going to the GPUs, and so on and so on. And I can use that to enhance my connectivity and how I do routing and so forth. So that's a really nice aspect of the optical domain that we get. We also get a lot of bad stuff, so don't think it's all, it's all good. Okay, so this is a little bit what it kind of looks like, right? So, um, so this is, you, you get a chip, it looks like a silicon chip like any other chip, but these are, these are kind of the optical components that are in there. Very often we use some, we, what we use are mi what we call micro ring resonators, that's kind of the, that's our, I guess that's maybe our best equivalent to a transistor even though I don't want to draw too many analogies, it's not. It's like, uh, but this is used as, we can use it as a, as a modulator, which means a way of um, changing an electrical signal to an optical signal. I take, I, take a, I take a laser light and I apply an electrical signal on it and I create bits of ones and zeros or whatever the modulation format that I want to have. I can also use it as a switch. I can route the light you know, from, from different ports. So this picture right here is actually a four by four optical router. Uh, this is a modulator, I can have, I can have detectors. And then I have, this is, this is a picture of, here is, this is one waveguide, that line that you see is one optical waveguide. And these uh, rings are each used as these controlled filters to pick out one of the wavelength channels. So this one, is, I, we just colored them blue, green, red, but they're not, those are not the actual colors. But there are different wavelength channels. So this one is used to pick out the wavelength one, wavelength two, three, and four. So those are examples of these little components that we can have. We can put them all on the same chip. We can design them and integrate them. And, and each, each of these components are extremely, can be made to be extremely energy efficient. So we can modulate the light um, uh, and, and tr transmit it with approximately picojoules per bit or less, sometimes hundreds of femtojoules per bit of energy. And, and that is where, th and, and then it can go over very long distances. Um, and, and this is where we get the energy efficiency gains. Okay, so the idea is now that we have some of this technology, um, it can potentially give us very high bandwidth with lots of wavelengths uh, integrated together, maybe some interesting connectivity. Um, you know, how do we put it into these systems? You know, how do we take this technology and, and use it in these computing architectures? Um, and so there is kind of the, you know, how, how do we actually leverage um, the, uh, the optical connectivity beyond just what we have today, which is, okay, let's just connect the long, the long wires that are between the racks. You know, we put a little optical transceiver here, a little optical transceiver there, and, 
and, and we're done. Um, OK, I'm going to skip this part. Um, so, um, so this is uh, you know, a little bit more on the optical technology. You know, how do we actually build an optical link, a very high bandwidth optical link? Right? And the way that it's done is we have, imagine we have a laser, and the laser is putting out um, multiple wavelengths of light, you know, just a broad spectrum, multiple wavelengths of light. And then we have this uh, sort of array of these little rings on the chip, and each one of the rings is putting data on each one of those specific wavelengths that are coming from the laser. So all together, you know, coming out of this fiber right here, for example, we might have you know, 16 different wavelengths, each one of them at 10 gigabit per second or 40 gigabit per second, whatever it is that the design might be. And then we might go into some kind of a routing network, an optical switch routing uh, network, and then we would go out and each one of the rings, once again, would be selecting. It's, it's just like having a radio receiver that's tuned to the right frequency. So it's, it's very similar except in the optical domain. So those are the kind of uh, technologies that we have to do. Now, I told you there's also some, some challenging things. This, the re there's a reason that this technology is not all over the place right now, besides the fact that it's, by the way, it's expensive still. Um, so optical components are um, thermally sensitive. If I just sit in a room in any kind of temperature, ambient temperature, um, you know, the, the material is going to have some changes in its index of refraction. Um, and that will change you know, some of the propagation, some of the you know, characteristics of the devices. So we have to keep things um, thermally stabilized. And uh, there are ways to do this. It's not a showstopper by any means. It's not even a big energy expenditure. But that is one of the, the key issues that always has to be considered in, the, in these designs. OK, so when we, when we talk about you know, designing uh, a silicon photonic uh, optical link, uh, what, what this slide is meant to show you is that there's a lot of things that go into that kind of design. It's not just like, okay, I'll just buy this chip, I'll, I'll make another chip and connect them together. You know, there's, there's really uh, a very detailed level of designing, you know, both the electronics, the drivers, the receivers, um, as well as the photonic uh, integrated circuits. Um, and, you know, and including things like the, um, like the thermal stabilization, uh, you know, the laser part and, and the clock distributions and, and, so, and so forth. The photodiodes, amplifiers, etc. Okay, so once, once we do, you know, once we do all of that and we have, you know, some of these designs, um, when, we, uh, when we implement one of these links, um, we want to make sure that uh, we are using, there's a certain amount of optical power that, that is in the link and that is part of our optical budget that we design for. Um, and then you know, all these different components that we put along the way are going to contribute all kinds of losses and other penalties. And so we want to make sure that we stay within our, our power budget. Um, so that's, that's sort of one limitation. But, but um, you know, the, more importantly, um, staying within the power budget, now we want to design the link to give us the maximum bandwidth and the lowest energy per bit. Right? And so this is, again, an example of that kind of design process that we do. And you can see here that in this particular example, we're getting one picojoule per bit of energy. We could get less, but if we got less, we would, we would not have as high data rates in that particular, in that particular link. OK. So very high level. OK, so now we got, let's say we take it for granted that we got these links designed and fabricated. The next thing that we want to worry about is the, um, the cost of these photonics links, which I would say is probably the main reason that you know, this technology is not quite widely deployed. Although, let me, let me just mention that pretty much every single um, uh, high performance or you know, any performance uh, you know, uh, industry out there that's looking uh, that's looking at the, the next generation systems is has very very uh, intense programs in this technology. So Intel, for example, has a whole business unit dedicated to silicon photonics. That that's how important this is. Um, uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprises, HPE. And I have to always, always say E now. It's kind of awkward, right? Um, they have a big 
a very big uh, investment in silicon photonics. IBM has a very uh, serious investment in silicon photonics. So this is, you know, this is definitely coming. Um, uh, and that, uh, so, so, but one of the challenges is the cost, right? And so you can see that, and, and you, might, you might think that maybe for the long distances as we have today, you know, the reason that optics is there is that the cost kind of maybe justifies, like if I had to put electrical signals um, for the long distance rack to rack connectivity, you know, those, th that cost would be high enough where going to optics makes sense. Um, but in the shorter distances where, I, where I'm talking about, where we really get the advantage of you know, this very high bandwidth, you know, processor to memory bandwidth, uh, processor to memory connectivity, you know, we're not there yet because of cost. And, and the reason is that at, when, the sh when the distances are very small, what you see here is the electrical. This was, this was from a few years ago, and this is a little bit updated, right? So um, what, what you can see here, this is from my, an IBM paper. So from a few years ago, this is the cost per gigabit per second of electrical, electrical connectivity. And, you know, it's a lot, you know, it's a factor of, you know, two, three less than, less than the optics. Now, the good thing about the optics is that it's kind of flat. You know, once I pay for it, I can go any distance and it's fine. Uh, whereas the on the electronics, as I go longer distances, my cost increases, you know, very fast. And so where is that crossover point, right? Maybe it's 20 meters, maybe more. Um, here it's, you know, here the optics is starting to come down. You see it's coming down by maybe another factor or two, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And, and business is brutal. So, you know, it doesn't matter how good, <laughs> it's a lesson important to learn. It doesn't matter how good the technology, you know, and so on and so on. If the cost is not going to be there, the price is not going to be there, it's not going to happen. Um, and so this is, this is, I can tell you on, on the other hand that this is something that all the optics industry is intensely working on because they obviously want to get into this, this market, not so much for maybe the high performance, but for the data centers and so forth. It's a, it's a very, very important business. Now, what, why is optics so expensive? I mean, fabricating the silicon photonics is, is not that expensive. You know, you, you, it's the same as making transistors, right? You go into a high performance. You don't even have to go to the, you don't have to go to the, the latest high performance CMOS fabrication. We don't have to go to the 14 nanometer. We can get good enough optics, you know, with the 90 nan nanometers, you know, 60 nanometer. Um, the cost of optics is in the packaging. It's almost the opposite as electronics. In electronics, you know, the high cost is, is the 14 nanometer fabrication, um, which can be millions of dollars, you know, and so forth per wafer. Um, uh, but the packaging is like a throwaway, it's plastic. Right? I mean, you know, the packaging plants is not a big deal. In the, in the optical world, it's exactly the opposite. The packaging is, for the most part, you know, really not very automated. And it has to be aligned, and you have to sort of attach the chips to optical fibers and the lasers and all, all that stuff. Yes, there is a ton of investment and tons of, uh, you know, efforts that are going on uh, because of the, the industry and the business associated with it to improve it. But it's still the, like about 80%, maybe even a little bit more of the cost of any optics is the packaging, where it's almost maybe the, exactly the opposite in electronics. And so, so really, you know, this is, uh, this is a very important aspect to keep an eye on. Uh, one of the areas that um, you can see here, this is from 20, just from this year, you know, one of the advances, this is a group at IBM, we're also working on this, um, is to, you know, to be able to package, you know, very dense arrays of these optical IOs. And, and really the, you know, the goal here is to, you know, I think the more, the more integration that we can get, the more, um, you know, optical integration that we can get together with the electronic nodes, uh, you know, that's kind of where the, the lowering the cost is going to be. Um, so one other, you know, little exercise that we went through was to look at, you know, where do we, you know, where do, how far do we need to go? Um, because, you know, you might think that, well, you know, yes, the packaging is expensive and optics is expensive, but maybe over the lifetime, the, the energy efficiency of the optics is going to save us money anyway, so maybe the cost can be amateurized in that way. It turns out, no, not, not really. It's still too expensive uh, right now. And what you see here, I'll just give you very quickly, is that, you know, this is sort of, 
the, the red, the big red bar is the procurement cost. This is how expensive it is. And the little blue thing is kind of how much you save from the energy, okay? So answer is no, we need to get, you know, we need to get cheaper. That's the bottom line. Okay, um, the next thing I just want to cover is uh, optical switching. So, you know, one big part of the optical story is the interconnect. We get, so just, if you don't remember anything, just remember that you can get, you can get these, these wires that have extremely high bandwidth, bandwidth density. Um, terabit per second per wire is sort of a thing to remember, terabit per second per wire. I get multiple wavelengths. And then also very, very good energy efficiency. So terabit per second per, you know, per, um, uh, per, per pin, and then about a picojoule per bit, okay? Those are the, the two numbers to keep in mind. Now, what else can I do? I can also do optical switching. Now, what's really unique, optical switching is very different than electrical switching. Um, primarily because optical switching is really a circuit type of switching, and it's essentially um, extremely, extremely broadband. So, um, you know, the simplest example is, is a mirror, right? So if I imagine I have, um, uh, you know, let's say 16 optical wavelengths um, that are propagating over my, my optical link, each one of them, you know, gigabits per second, so very high bandwidth, right? Hundreds of gigabits per second. And I want to switch them. I want to change their, you know, from going to port number one to port number two. I can, I can switch them all essentially with the equivalent flick of a mirror, right? If I have a mirror, the mirror is essentially broadband. It will reflect the same for, you know, all 16 wavelengths for the most part. Of course, if you go too, too far, there's limitations. So this is, you know, so it's like a, you know, a ter it could be like a terabit per second switch, right? Because it basically can switch, you know, huge bandwidths with just a flick of a, a mirror. So the, there's, there's actual mirrors, which are called uh, MEMS. You may have heard of MEMS, you know, microelectrical mirrors. Um, this is an example of a, of a box that, that a company makes um, that has 320 by 320 MEMS. Um, but there are also integrated mirrors, which essentially I can make the equivalent of the same mirror switch in a, in a silicon photonic uh, chip. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit and, and how we might use it. But just to kind of bring you into um, the understanding of what the differences are between, you know, we like to, to use this analogy, you know, so optical switching is essentially bufferless, right? So I can just change the direction of the light. I can choose to put, you know, some wavelengths here and some wavelengths there. I can, I can do all of that. I can steer the light, you know, very, very efficiently with very little energy and, and the light can have essentially, you know, very large bandwidths, very, very high data rates. But I can't really store those bits. I can't, like, um, as you saw in the previous talk, you know, we heard about some networks that had congestion. And so when, when two streams of data came into the same intersection or the two processors wanted to access the same location in memory, you know, one got placed essentially in the buffer on, on hold until waiting its turn, right? I can't do that in the optical domain because unfortunately the photons don't like to stay still. And so they just want to keep going and going and going and going. So it's this kind of, you know, it's this, have this picture in your mind. It, I can switch circuits, I can make them go around the world, um, but I can't, you know, easily, it's not impossible, but it's just against the grain of the technology to, to store them um, as, in, as in the electrical. So we have to think of a different way of designing optical switches to benefit from them in our, in our systems. Um, again, I like to make things physical because I'm an experimentalist. So here's an example. So this is an FPGA board that we build in my lab that has an optical switch that is on a chip. This is a silicon photonic optical switch, right? Um, so this just happens to be a small one. It's a four by four. This is the chip. We package it, we wire bond it, and we put it on this huge board because, you know, the students have to work with it. And then we control it with a FPGA. So just to throw out there, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, th these are real physical things. And then we like to, you know, this is an example of, you know, how we fabricate these switches and, and, and so on and so on. And so, so th these are real things and, and they're actual chips that we can do. This one is, a, is kind of a, a neat new design that we're working on where we're also, we're not just 
um, changing the wavelengths. We're not just switching. Uh, we're not just switching the um, the spatial uh, uh, routing of of the optics, but we're also selecting the wavelengths. So here, you know, you can you know you can come in here and then you you can switch out to a different port, but you can also you know have you know wavelength selectivity associated with with the switching. And and this is an, um, I should mention that you know one of the big things in the U.S. right now that is enabling us to, to do all of this work, you know, to bring photonics from, you know, the optical table and the single, you know, kind of device to, to be able to think about system design with, with photonics is that there's a new institute that was formed a couple of years ago called AIM, AIM. It's called the American Institute for Manufacturing Photonics. And Columbia happens to be one of the, the partners in this institute. And it is um, the main thing about this institute. It has many parts and you know, packaging and all kinds of capabilities. But the main part of that is that it has a 300 millimeter CMOS line up in Albany, New York, that is dedicated to photonics. And so this is, this is a huge thing. Those of you that are familiar with fabrication, how expensive it is, how difficult it is. Um, so this is, uh, this is the key kind of jewel of, of this institute. So we have access to it, and there's these multi-project wafer runs um, that we can access and so forth. And, and this, is, uh, this is not a closed system. This is open. Um, and, you know, uh, for, I don't think this is the, the crowd, but, you know, just in case, uh, just as an FYI, yes, you can, you can access, you know, these MPWs, and you can submit designs, and you can make uh, photonic uh, chips. Um, for, uh, under this, uh, uh, you know, institute. Okay, so, so, you know, this is just a little flavor without getting into too much detail. So optical switching is not, doesn't, is not a packet switch. It's a circuit switch technology. I don't have the buffers. I have to keep things moving. So the question is, what is it good for? What can I use it for, you know, in these, in these kinds of computing systems? And one of the directions that we're looking at and I think is very promising, is the idea of using optics for bandwidth steering. Again, in the last talk, you saw the, um, the, uh, the Dragonfly architecture in the Cray, right? And this is basically an all to all. And uh, one of the things that uh, we looked at um, and we're continuing to look at is, so, so, so you have an all to all, um, uh, this is, I guess, this is the picture that I would, I would refer you to, right? So this is, this is the all-to-all um, the -all connectivity between the groups in the Dragonfly architecture. And, but all of this connectivity essentially is electronic, which I would say is, is, is static, right? It's I have, you know, it's all-to-all, -all, it's great connectivity, but it's basically static. It's, it's you know, I have, a, I have a wire or an equivalent of a wire that's connecting, you know, one thing to another thing. And it has a certain data rate and it has a certain limitation. And remember, um, you know, Scott was saying, well, you know, if I, I want to go out of the group, inside the group, it's great. It's all to all, you know, small connectivity. But if I want to go out of the group, maybe I only have five, you know, five connections I can go to. So what if I could use the optics to change that? And, you know, instead of having only five, I could steer bandwidth from other connections so that if I wanted to go from from uh, group one to group two, maybe I could steal all the other people's, all the other group's connections, you know, with my optical switches and put, you know, five times five, 25 equivalent bandwidth there, right? And so this is exactly what we're doing and, and exactly what we can do. So we can take optical switches and stick them inside these architectures and essentially do bandwidth steering. And the great thing about the optics is that it's agnostic to the data rate, you know, I can combine different, different wires. To, I can com essentially combine the different connectivities together, you know, fairly straightforwardly. And so what this is supposed to signify is that suppose I have this architecture, but I want to maximize the bandwidth of, I guess this is kind of a near neighbor connectivity diagram, right? Because I'm doing this particular application, I can do that. And I can concentrate all the bandwidth, you know, exactly where I want it you know, with my optical steering. And so we think this is a very promising direction for the photonics. Uh, it requires all the components. It requires having the optical um, silicon photonics there so I can, I, can have, I can have it and having those optical switches integrated. 
The good news is that I don't need a very high radix photonic switch, which is very hard, harder to do. I can, I can get a lot of advantages, even with just a, you know, a four by, an eight by eight, four by four, eight by eight type of uh, switch. And, and so, um, uh, again, this is, uh, you know, even inside that high performance node, so this is on the outside in, inter group, but even inside the node, I can use some, some of these optical switches to, uh, to do bandwidth steering, right? So I can, I can put some of the switches, and so maybe instead of, you know, the actual wires that I have in there, I can connect, you know, one of the CPUs to all the memories, or, you know, in, and the thing that's great about it is it's very flexible. I can, because it's switched and it's controlled. So I can, I can have it, you know, I, you know, I can have the connectivity, um, uh, you know, as, as prescribed by the specific application or by, or by my specific um, uh, requirements. And so again, if I have, um, even, you know, I can take a conventional architecture, I can stick, you know, these, th these orange boxes are supposed to signify my bandwidth steering optical switches, and I can then, you know, kind of change the routing, essentially change the routing diagram on the fly with any bandwidth. I can connect four to one, you know, one, one to, you know, one to six and so forth. Um, and this is an example of, you know, being able to connect, you know, more heterogeneous components, you know, inside the node as well. Okay, so, um, you know, just kind of, you know, summary, summarizing it up, you know, we definitely have a need for, for bandwidth and connectivity, you know, especially as I showed you in the very beginning in this high performance system, the, the gap is very clear to us. Um, and, and this, you know, we're reaching the limit of, yes, we can get to the top 500 and, and all of that, but what is the actual performance when our bytes per flop is going to, you know, double O, triple O um, ratios? Uh, so that, that's uh, very challenging. So, you know, optics can, can deliver some of that back. It's not gonna get us all the way back. Uh, but it can definitely uh, help in terms of increasing the bandwidth in, the, in, a, in an energy efficient manner. Um, but we have some challenges, of course, especially with regards to cost. I mean, I didn't quite realize how critical that is, but it really is very critical. And it's not that it's, you know, usually as academics, sometimes as academics, we might say, well, you know, that's not my problem, you know, let industry figure out cost. But it actually turns out to be important because you can, you can come up with innovative technical solutions that change the cost situation. Like in, in optics, that's why, for example, what we're working on is very innovative ways of doing optical packaging. You know, how do we combine these, these fibers with the silicon photonic chip in, in different coupling modalities and, and so forth. So there's interesting technology, science, and research that you can do that eventually actually changes the cost equation too. So I, I find that kind of cool. Um, and then, you know, we think that at the system level, the, you know, the optical interconnects um, are very interesting from, you know, especially from this bandwidth steering uh, capability, this flexibility for the bandwidth steering. So I uh, just want to thank, you know, these are uh, various sponsors. And this down here, the AIM Photonics, if you're interested, if you're curious, you can just, you know, go AIM Photonics. I think it's, you just Google it and you'll find it. So thank you very much, appreciate it. Uh, so I'm just, first I'm assuming there, like there's physical movement, is that correct? Uh, so no, so, uh, in, so there are two different kinds. One is um, MEMS, um, so those are those kind of more bulky ones that I showed you, the boxes, the commercial ones. So the, so the MEMS really are mechanical. I mean, they're, they're on a micro scale level, but if you look under a microscope, you will see a mechanical mirror that's actually moving. So that's one kind. What we're working on in silicon photonics is, is an electro-optic switch. So you don't, there's no mechanical movement associated with it. You're changing, you're actually applying an electrical signal, you're changing the index of refraction in, in the device, and, and that changes the coupling and the steering. So, so there's, it's not mechanical in that, in that type. Yeah, I was just going to yeah. say what would be the, like, the expected time between failure for something like that, but I see, right. yeah. Uh, it, it actually turns out the MEMS are really good. It, um, and, you know, they're, they're both, uh, with the electro-optic ones, there just hasn't been enough study on it to, to look at lifetimes yet. 
Um, the, and the MEMS, were, that was always an important question for the MEMS, and, but I believe now they're, they're actually quite, quite good and commercially deployed. The other, the other important distinction is the, the speed, right? So the reason that we're looking at the silicon photonic, the electro-optic integrated ones, is that they, they can get to sub-nanosecond switching speed. And that's very important when you're trying to, to do things you know, within computing systems and minimize latencies and things like that. The, the MEMS are slower. They're milliseconds, sometimes you know, hundreds of microseconds. So, so they're a little bit more sort of large, you know, large kind of moving lar lots of wires around. So, uh, yeah. Thank you for an exciting talk. I have three questions. Three? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll try to remember. So what's like the most preferable range of wavelengths to use for the light? Uh, good question. So um, it, it seems that there's a lot of migration towards the 1.3 micron, even though a lot of the interconnects in computing systems are, are kind of at the 850, you know, because most of, most of the uh, connectivity right now is, is using VIXELs. I didn't, I didn't mention VIXELs very much, but VIXELs are actually great technology and they're used a lot in high performance systems. Um, so that's the prevalent technology. And, and the VIXELs are in the 850 nanometer wavelength range, 900. Um, the silicon photonics is, traditionally the telecom market has been more at the 1.5 micron, but Going, going a little shorter into the 1.3 micron is, seems to be the, the place where, where it seems to make sense. Right, so this kind of wavelength is kind of relatively huge compared to the transistor and whatnot. Yes. So is it going to be making the our computer a little bit bulkier? Um, it, uh, also good question. So, so yes, yeah, so the, all of these optical you know, devices that I showed you are much larger than a transistor, for sure. You know, they're, they're kind of... Um, you know, on a micron scale in, in size. Um, although yeah, the rings are definitely much more compact than other optical components. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I, the idea is that they're, they're not, you know, they're, at least our approach, it's not, there's no monolithic integration of the photonics, you know, with the CMOS transistors. It's basically, it's really like a separate chip. I mean, the, the main reason for doing it in silicon is that you can, you can, make, you, can, you can make these circuits, you can, you can put other electronics, like the driver electronics, you know, co-integrated with the photonics. So you have a complete, you know, fully, you know, full photonic circuit chip that's working. But, you know, then you take your electronic chip, or whether it's, you know, you, you know CPUs, GPUs, memory, and, and the idea is that then you do some, some sort of either 2.5D or 3D integration flip chip bonding, things like that, that, that will go with the electronics. So it won't take up area from your electronics, um, but yes, it will be more complex for sure. And then, like, does it gonna have a lot of, like, kind of efficiency, efficiency loose when you, like, converting the electronic to uh, optics? Do we... Right, so, so that, that's exactly the, the point of, um, you know, where the, energy, where the energy consumption is, it's actually very, very efficient. So all, all the picojoule per bit that I've been talking about is exactly, you know, you know how do you, in, in driving these photonics, you know, with the electronic signal, um, you, and I wanna, I wanna have that conversion as close to the electronic uh, signal as, as I possibly can, because that's gonna make it the most efficient. One, once I go into the optical domain, I can, I can go very long distances without taking any losses at very, very high speeds. And do people look at like surface plasmons? Like, uh, yes, they're, they're definitely, it's definitely an active area of research. Um, I would say it's a little bit further out. Um, you know, the, the, the plasmons have very high losses, and, but, but you're right in the sense that the, the plasmonics can get you to very tight you get, they get much tighter um, uh, integration than, than the optical wavelengths. Yes. Okay. So it's an area, but it's still right now. Right now, it's very, very early on. Okay. Just one last question. So, like, so I think that's four. It's four. Oh, okay. Okay. okay.